Ah. Uh, so, okay, so let's do this. We got a couple of minutes. So somebody chime in on this school situation. Steve, would you inform us just what it is? Because folk, some folks don't have kids, uh, and they're those that don't have kids in public school. So can you just tell them, educate the people on what it is? Thank you. Right. 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 So, so, so it's not a case when you say this does not affect you. It does. It affects your bottom line. I think the other part of that is you have to start looking at having a voice in the services that are going in certain schools. Mm. So, again, you have to be coming up with the other way. It's one tonight at U.S. Grant. Right. 
Right. Right. Thank you, Steve. Somebody say amen. 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 That is important for you all to know because my position is always the same from, from this vantage point. Don't, don't, and I said this last week and I reiterated it, and the challenge for me, Steve, is here, <coughs> is in this vein. Don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Don't, don't think that your spirituality is simply within four walls or 66 books of that Bible. The reality is your spirituality is so much more. And if you're not hearing that, if you're not, if that doesn't affect you, and I tell people now, if those things don't affect your level of spirituality, you need to go back and have a conversation with your God. Because the God that we serve does not exist in a building. He doesn't exist within just 66 pages, 66 books. He exists everywhere. He's in the school system. He's in the school board. And we have to make sure as people of God, that we are representing him, whether it be at school board meetings or wherever. We cannot be an apathetic people. Apathy will get you put on a ship. Somebody say amen. Hawk, stand up, please. Would you inform them about what's happening at OU? Oh, Jesus. Right, you don't work at OU. Right, 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 right. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. And so this, and then we'll move on to Bible study. I told my students on yesterday, you know this, Sam, you know, Francie, those of you who've been in OU know, it is becoming too comfortable 
on that campus for people to do those things. It is becoming way too comfortable. If you had the SAS incident, which was obviously not the first incident, but it did get national attention, it should have been addressed then in a serious manner. It was not. So then you had this other incident on Snapchat. Then we have this incident today. It is, com it is becoming too common at University of Oklahoma for people to parade their racist views in public. I told my students yesterday, that's way too common, yes. Mm -hmm. No, no, hog on answer right now. Better you than me. Because <laughs> I know the answer. <laughs> right. Right. He did. Nobody. <laughs> so say Michael Hawker. <laughs> Close my mouth. Yes, sir. Bless to you. Yes. Yes, faculty. Yeah. No question. No question. Well, but you got to think about it. President Boren, in many cases, has been carrying Jabari since Jabari was president there. So inevitably, it's almost like at a faculty level, you're at the bottom of the ring. I'm, 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 I'm the dude, what, bro, what brother Bose did? I'm the dude that tests the minds before they send the people through. I'm at the bottom. All I am is a faculty member educating another generation. <laughs> I'm at the bottom. I have no... I have no, I or Dr. Coleman, we have no say. We go in there, hey, who are you? I teach this, this. They already don't want the AFM department. They already don't want it, which is why they don't give money to it, right? That was because of the appeal over years, over year, years, like in the 70s, we need the AFM department. So they kept appealing, they gave it to them. Boren was connected to the previous head of AFM. So she went in and said, I need something. She would get it, but it wasn't like it was slated equal like the other departments. So now, uh, Carlos is over now. He's, he's new, um, but as a faculty member, especially adjunct, Steve, I'm at, the bottom of, I'm at the bottom of the barrel. I just teach. I just share knowledge, you know, and then, they, and then there are times that they don't invite me on purpose. <laughs> they don't. They don't, really. Really, I'm, when the whole SAE thing came out, they, they, they don't, don't because too much was happening here. But I will say this, as I talked to my students on yesterday, there was an apathy, because I have a lot of athletes. There was an apathy, not because they won't do something, there was an apathy because they don't expect anything to change if they do something. So most of my football players are like, what are we gonna do, Pat Coleman? Like, we all on scholarship. Like, what are we gonna do? Like, really, uh, because they had, this is what they did. They had a protest at 1230. PM. Well, most of my students in class. And so I was like, are y'all going to the protest? I was like, y'all can go. They were like, no, nah, no, nah, we good. <laughs> because they don't want to be seen in that environment for fear of retribution for their scholarships. The percentage of African Americans at the University of Oklahoma on scholarship is astronomical. So if you're caught in one of those environments, you don't know what's going to happen. Sam knows that. Sam knows that. Right? So I mean, at the end of the day, I have when Hogg was at OU, he had more stroke than I did. I, I'm a teacher. Well, <laughs> I'm a teacher. Can't do anything. 
All I do is go share knowledge, teach, and I leave. And, and, and sometimes you're not even welcome to go to those things. You know? And once again, change comes because the students demand it, not because the faculty demands it. If the students want something, the students demand it, they'll listen to that. But the students got to be consistent and keep pushing. Don't give up. You got to keep pushing. Faculty, people trying to get that check and go home. And the church said amen. <laughs> amen. All right, somebody say amen. Can y'all give God praise for Brother Steve and Brother Michael? Come on, give God praise for them. All right, let's go, Amanda, let's go. All hands on deck, start rolling through them. Amanda upstairs. Okay, all right, keep going. Keep going. All right, y'all remember the five purposes of the church, right? Say yes, because we're going to go fast. Please say yes. All right, worship. Everybody say worship. Say ministry. Say evangelism. Say fellowship. Say discipleship. How many purposes of the church, y'all? Yeah, but you like I do my students, there will be a quiz at the end of this. Amen. How many purposes of the church? They are worship. Say it, worship, ministry, evangelism, fellowship, discipleship. Next slide. Go. All right. Five. Keep going. Go ahead. Five goals for believers to personalize their purpose. God wants me to be a member of his family. That's fellowship. God's going to be a, be a model of character. Personalized goal of discipleship. God's want me, God wants me to be a minister of his grace. Personalized goal of ministry. God's going to be a, minister, a messenger of his love. Personalized goal of evangelism. God wants me to be a magnifier of his name. Personalized goal of worship. Everybody say amen. Stop right there. Don't go no further. So watch this. When I teach this, I have to be intentional because my goal is to get you to see the church is corporate, but it's also individual. You, you as a believer cannot be so concerned about the corporate church that you forget that you are the church. Say amen. amen. Uh, do better, y'all. Say amen. amen. You are the church. So watch this. If you are not being the church, you can't come to the church expecting the church to be the church. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. You have to be the church. Everybody say amen. amen. If you're the church, then when you come to the church, it's like it's 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 uh, it's synergy. It all goes together. The problem is when you are not being the church, but yet you come to the church and you want the church to be everything, and it's not designed to be everything because you are the church. Say amen. Next slide. Go. Only the church can. The church by things that cannot be found anywhere else in the world. Worship. Helps people focus on God. Fellowship helps them face life's problems. Discipleship helps them fortify their faith. Ministry helps them find their talents. Evangelism helps them fulfill their mission. Y'all got that? Say amen. amen. Keep going. Go. Next. 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 All right, here it is. Did you know that as believers we're all part of one body? Everybody say one body. When we believe on Christ, we're baptized by the Holy Spirit in his profound unity and shared in the glories of Jesus Christ, the head of the church. Next. Did you know that as believers, we're all part of one body? God has ordained a great diversity in his unity like members of an orchestra. We've been given different parts to play in the symphony. Everybody say different parts. And this is the line, y'all. And it won't sound right with all the musicians playing their parts. Say amen. If you do what you're supposed to do, and everybody does what they're supposed to do, it makes the whole body work together. Somebody say amen. amen. Come on, y'all, say amen. amen. If you don't like children, you don't need to be in children's church. Amen, amen. amen. say amen. amen. If you have a bad attitude, you don't need to usher. I can't hear nobody at Fifth Street, right? If you can't count, you don't need to be nowhere near money. Say amen. amen. What's worse than not operating in your gift is being in the wrong place, thinking you got a gift. Are you with me? The church is not a building, but a group of people knit together the body of Christ. God wants to submit to him, serve him, as well as his body. Next. All right. What's the motivation? Everybody say love. love. All right. Now, <clears throat> I taught this last week, so I got to touch it. Nothing in the church functions properly without the spirit of love. Okay? Watch this. And I tell people this. So you come to church, you should not have to put on anything to come in here. Okay? 
When you come in the building, you shouldn't all of a sudden put a smile on your face. If you don't smile out there, <laughs> you, you ain't going to smile in here. Okay, y'all say ouch or something, say amen, y'all. I know people, I grew up in church, this is not new to me, who were nicer out there. Why y'all finishing my Bible study? Than they were in here. Because I knew people that loved being out there, but when they came in here, it's like they put something on. Maybe I need to say it to get, some, get y'all to react. There's nothing worse than a fake Christian. Like you pretend like you love me. You pretend like I'm good with you. You pretend like I'm okay. Every ministry, every gift has to be motivated by love. Everybody say love. love. Do better, y'all. Say love. love. Hear me, hear me. Everybody say love. love. I need the church, everybody, to say love. love. Not, not this symptomatic, I love you in your face, but I'm going to talk about, about you behind your back. Well. Not this symptomatic, Oh, they knew I really don't know them, so I can't trust them. Everything you do as a believer has to be off the platform of love. I'm going to do it again because y'all looking at me crazy. Everybody say love, love. not like. Not you better get that. Because at the end of the day, what makes a church functional, what makes the body of Christ, not a church, the body of Christ, functional. Everybody has to have a spirit of love. Now, now watch this. It gets murky because love is done without judgment. Okay? So watch this. You can't say you love me and judge me at the same time. At some point, I was, I was, in, the, I was in the barbershop last week, and uh, the owner of the barbershop, uh, female, started talking about um, why... Um, something, something about black people. I don't know what she was on, sister. She was, she was talking some good stuff, but then she went off the deep end. She said, she said, yeah, I like these people um, on food stamps. They get food stamps and then they sell them. And, and I don't understand. They start, I said, whoa, 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 what? She said, I don't understand. She said, some of these people, they just messed up in the head. They get food stamps and they sell them. I said, pause. I said, why are you judging them? She said, well, it, I said, whoa, 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 I said, you don't know the reason why people sell food stamps. I said, have you ever had food stamps? She said, no. I said, so let's start there. You've never been where they are, so let's take the judgment out of that. I said, number two, does God, have you made mistakes in your life? She looked at me and said, who, have I? I said, did God not have grace on you? She said, uh, yeah. I said, then how about you give what you got? If God gave you grace for what you've done, why don't you show a little grace to some other people? Can I be honest with y'all? We need to be a little more gracious with people. Somebody say amen better than that, y'all. A little bit more gracious, a lot less judgment. A whole lot, like I don't know what your problem is, I don't know what you're going through, but I'm going to show you the love of God. And it doesn't mean that I like what you do, but God never asked me to like what you do. He asked me to love you. So I'm going to love you regardless. You can't judge me. You can't condemn me. You can't, at the end of the day, you don't have a heaven to put me in or a, he- a hell to put me in or a heaven to keep me out of. My motivation, your motivation has to be love. Everybody say love. love. Keep going. <sighs> spiritual gifts. Remember we talked about this last week. Y'all got it? Everybody say spiritual gifts. Not the same as the Holy Spirit. Go, Amanda. Not human talent. Y'all remember that? Just because you can sing don't mean you're anointed. (laughs) Say amen. Amen. Just because you can sing does not mean you're anointed. Are you with me? Why y'all say amen, somebody? your, Your spiritual gift is God's supernatural ability coming on you. That's not human talent. Everybody has spiritual gifts. Say amen. Do better, y'all. Say amen. Amen. Go next. Uh, Gifts such as miracles, tongues, healing, prophecy are supernatural. The Holy Spirit takes these God-given ability, use them for its purposes in the lives of believers. Go next. Uh, It's not the fruit of the Spirit. Somebody say amen. Amen. 
The gifts of the Spirit are not the same as the fruit of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit have to do with service, while the fruit of the Spirit has to do with character. All right? I told you all that last week. Everybody say service. service. Everybody say character. Yeah. You can be gifted and nasty at the same time. Are you with me? You, just because you're gifted doesn't mean that's the end of your gift. you got to have some fruit to go with the gift. Okay, y'all ain't say nothing. Say amen, y'all. You know people that are gifted. I know people. You know people that are gifted, but they, their fruit is rotten. You are co-opting the gift if all you do is your gift, but you won't speak to me. Right? This is fundamental stuff. Why? Look up here. Because nobody in the church today, it's very difficult to find, people don't talk about character anymore. They don't talk about character. They don't talk about treating people right. Because what is it? Everybody, watch this, this is going to go, watch this. Everybody wants to be on the stage, but don't nobody want to learn and mature on the step. Somebody say amen. If you can't mature on the step, then you don't deserve the stage. A whole lot of people are hungry to get up here, but don't want to take their time and learn down here. Because down here is where you learn how to handle people, how to love people, how to do what you do, how to be kind to people, how to be gracious to people. Do you understand? Do you understand? The stage is, the stage is empty if your character can't hold you. You can be gifted as the day is long, but if you don't treat people right, Eventually, God will cause you to step down, right? Somebody says it's better to be asked up from down to up than to be asked from up to down. <laughs> That's what that means. At some point, that has to mean something. Go, next. Spiritual gift versus spiritual fruit. Spiritual gifts are the mean. Spiritual, gift, spiritual gifts are the means. Spiritual fruit is the end. Next. The categories of spiritual gifts. Please repeat after me. Say motivational gifts. Say ministry gifts. Next slide, Amanda. Manifestation gifts. Say manifestation gifts. There are three gifts of the Spirit, y'all. Everybody say motivation. Say ministry. Say manifestation. I'm going to help you. I'm gonna, you're going to get this in a minute. Keep going. Motivational gifts. Here we go. That's what I want to get to tonight. The gifts of God's grace shape how the believer views life, reacts to others, and impacts the body of Christ. As motivational gifts can be compared to a set of eyeglasses from God given so that the believer can see people and circumstances through that particular set of lenses. Go. A motivational gift can be compared to Santa God's. Okay, next. I did it again. Next. Here are seven motivational gifts. Let's go through them. Everybody say prophecy, prophecy. serving, prophecy. teaching, teaching, exhorting, prophecy. giving, prophecy. organizing, prophecy. mercy. I, I need the house to say this. Now y'all got to go with me. Come on. Everybody say prophecy, prophecy. serving, prophecy. teaching, Exhorting, giving, organizing, mercy. Stop right there, Amanda. Here it is. Why am I teaching this? Because to me, this is important. To me, in order for, in order for the body of Christ to not just be a building where you come and sit, right, it eventually will die. You need people moving. Everybody say moving. You got to operate in the gift that God gave you, right? If you don't operate in the gift that God gave you, you, okay, watch this. Tie your arm to your body and don't use it for a year. Two years. Three years. Come on, what happens? It's useless. And it, it what? Eventually dies. If you don't move your arm, the blood stops circulating. Somebody say something to me. And the arm will come off. Can I help you? Can I, can I say it? Say it, Coleman. I'm talking to myself now. Say it, Coleman. Your dead arm will affect the rest of your body. And the doctors will say, we got to cut it off. Somebody say amen. Okay, y'all didn't see it, but I'm going to help you understand. The church operates the same way. If you have dead folk in church, the dead folk infect the other folk and ca cause death over the whole church. That's why you can't, that's why you, every, let, okay, let me digress. That's why you can't have everybody in your circle. You better make sure you got some folk with some blood running through them, right? Because at the end of the day, if they unhealthy, you become unhealthy too. 
Somebody say amen. You got to make sure that the people around you got blood flowing. I ain't talking about the blood in your body either. <laughs> say amen, y'all. Right? That's why motivational gifts are important because if you don't use your, and, that, and part of me, part of me is so, is, is pressed to get people involved and active because if you don't get involved and active, you become a threat to the rest of us. You become a threat to the rest of us, and you and so now, so now when you come around, we distance ourselves from you. Because we know you're sick. You ain't got no blood flowing through you. And I ain't talking about the blood in your body. Are you with me today? Right? I'm trying to shake this because what happens, let me do it, let me do it, let me do it. What happens in, in African American churches is that is that we become complacent. And, and just and so so when Steve gets up talking about go to meetings and stuff, we like, mm, go to a meeting. Mm. When Hog gets up talking about what's happening to you, mm, uh, oh, that requires me to do something. Yes, it does. Why? Because at the end of the day, you don't serve an, an, uh, an inactive God. Your God is moving. So God says, if I move, you should do something. This is not all about what I'm doing. It's what you're going to do. How are you going to participate, get involved, work whatever gift you have, whether it's in church or out of church, it doesn't matter, but you got to do something. Say do something. All right, do them again. Everybody say prophecy, serving, teaching, exhorting, giving, organizing, mercy. Next. Everybody say ministry gifts. It's get good right here. Ministry gifts are the tools used to build up the church. They are practical, essential, can-do types of gifts, such as those described in Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Everybody with me? Go ahead, next. For the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of faith, and the knowledge of the Son of God into a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Here it is. Ministry gifts are often confirmed by our nation. The apostle Paul told Timothy, neglect not the gift that is in you, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on the hands by the elders. All right, next. Let's go. Here we go. All right, so the first set of gifts we have are motivational gifts. Everybody say motivational gifts. Some of you are teachers in here. Some of you are encouragers in here. Those are motivational gifts. You find where you can take the motivational gift you have, work the gift through, work your motivational gift through the instrument that God has given you. That's motivational. In other words, you're able to see things. You're able to, you are God's eyeglasses. You see hurt. You see pain. You see people in need. You see people, you see a need. You want to use your gift to fulfill the need. Everybody say amen. amen. I'm losing y'all already. Say amen. It means you create the, whatever instrument that is, whatever ministry that is. You take your gift and you work your gift through that instrument. It's a motivational gift. You are God's eyeglasses. You sense stuff. You see stuff. You feel stuff. That could be, look, I tell people all the time. So, so, so if you're a motivational gift, you could, you could have a motivational gift and be an usher. You can be a, have a motivational gift and be a deacon. You have a motivational gift and be uh, uh, in new members ministry. You have a motiv All of that is relative because a motivational gift is you see something, you want to empower people, you recognize the need, and you serve. Everybody say serve. serve. I'm losing them. Say serve. serve. You get me? It, it is a motivational gift. You see something, you sense something, it's a need. And you say, you know what, Pastor Coleman, I see we have a need for this. Now I have to tell people this, this is my own caveat that I'm including here. Don't come to me with what we need and then expect me to do it. <coughs> say amen. I ain't see it, amen. You saw it, <laughs> say amen. Everybody got 12 things Pastor wanna do. I got 25 already, amen. Don't need yours, amen. You see it, so you work it. You work it. I'm not the one that's going to work it. I have to say that to people in many different arenas because people think that when they feel something, that they're supposed to be 
Uh, Martin Scorsese, they the director. You ain't the director, you the worker. <laughs> say amen, y'all. Do better, say amen. All right, so that's motivational gift. Everybody say motivational gift. Come on, do it again. Say motivational gift. If there, you see a need, you say I, there's a need that I'm sensing that can affect the kingdom, that can empower people, that can strengthen children, that can do whatever. That is a mo you take a motivational gift and you funnel the gift through the instrument of that ministry. Are you with me? Okay, everybody got what I'm saying? You recognize a need, you sense it, you feel it, all right? So, let, so I gotta get that, motivational gift. I'm gonna do this one and then we're gonna do questions. A compelling call. Now, ministry gifts, everybody say ministry gifts. There's a second part to gifts and that is um, the gift of preaching and teaching, okay? So the first one is motivational, but the second one really is reserved for, it can be classified as ordained ministry, okay? Everybody say amen. All right, here we go. It's ordained ministry. Everybody say ordained ministry. It means that you sense a call from God to do ministry. It's a sensing. It's a compelling. Okay, here it is. Martin Lloyd-Jones, famed preacher, theologian, lays out what he believes are 60 signature marks of this divine summons to preach and or teach. Everybody look up here. Okay, whew. I gotta get my steps in, that's why I'm walking so much, y'all. All right. Uh, how do I say this? God is in the business of calling people to preach and teach. It's gonna get murky. But let me do it. You got to be called. Here it is. I'm about to leap out there. And anybody can be called. Anybody. Anybody. Let me get, I'm in Oklahoma now, so I got to, let me work my thing now. Men and women. There is great controversy in the body of Christ, particularly amongst some of my more traditional brethren. You know, y'all like how I talk like that? I can, I can do it when I have to. <laughs> Regarding women in ministry. Let me, let me, let me say this to y'all. Um, I cannot serve a liberating God and at the same time tell his creation that God can't speak through them. I can't do it. I betray what I believe. God can call anybody, a man or a woman. If he can make Deborah a judge and rule over a nation, he can call a woman to preach his gospel. Now, I know the folk don't like that because we, we into, and it, here we go, here we go, uh, Keith, we're into mimicking what the oppressor does. Black folk have mastered that. So what we do is, we say we don't want to be oppressed, but yet we mimic the behavior of the oppressor. So now you got to make a decision. You're going to be free, or you're going to be a copycat. You want to do what they do, or you want to be free with your God. Now, I know it's hard. I know it's hard. I know people struggle with that, and that's between you and God. You, you, you between you and God. For me, when I went to seminary, I sat in classrooms with women right next to me who were pastors in seminary getting an education. And they were called to ministry. I, am, I do not believe that God is a chauvinist. I do not believe. The book says he's not a respecter of persons. So for me to sit here as a pastor 
and tell a woman, God can't speak through you, then what does that say about my God? That God is actually saying that God can't take a female and speak through her? But we have all these examples of God using weak men. If the Bible is right, y'all, all of the men in the, in the Old Testament had issues. So what's your problem? Abraham lied and said Sarah was a sister and not his wife, and God used him. Noah got drunk on the eve of reconstruction, and God used him. David slept with Bathsheba and killed Uriah. God used him. I, do we need to go any further, y'all? Help me, y'all. At some point, Peter, I don't even say, I, Peter did everything, y'all, I think. <laughs> Peter was running drugs or something. You know what I'm saying? I mean, come on, man. Peter did everything. God used Peter. At the end of the day, and I'm trying, I got to do this because this is, you know, God assigned me to Fifth Street. I don't pass it to other church. At some point, we have to become the liberators of the God who is a liberator. We can't put ceilings on women and say you can't do something because the minute we do that, what does that say about our God? Help me, y'all. No limits. That's the God I serve. I just had to let it sit because I know, and, and I'll be honest with you, I have a lot of women that, that are not comfortable with women preaching. A lot of men, I don't struggle with, it's sisters. They struggle with it for some reason because once again, you mimic the behavior of the oppressor. <laughs> Instead of you encouraging it, what we have a tendency to say is, you know, God, God ain't call her. <laughs> say amen, y'all. Why y'all so quiet in Bible study? God didn't call her. First of all, who are you to tell anybody who got called? Say amen, y'all. Say something to me. Amen. Ouch. Preach, I'm changing my membership. Say something. Say something. Because this is the catch. Because I think many women have been called by God and have ignored it. They've ignored it because at the end of the day, what? We want to mimic. We're afraid of stepping out. We're afraid of hearing it. God's voice can speak to anybody. I can't hear nobody in Fifth Street. God's voice can speak to anybody. Now, now, Steve and I have had this debate for years. You know, I love Steve. We've had this debate. How you go, I've I, I, I changed a little bit, so let me amend what I, how you go about your call is up to you. If you feel God call you and you need to go to school, then go to school. But I tell anybody, whatever you do, the book says simple, study to show yourself approved. Get a book, don't just get up and talk. And th those of us that do read, we gonna challenge you. Cause if you get up and you just talk and I'm gonna say something about you. Cause I reads with an S. <laughs> I do reads. <laughs> I am educated. So if you get up flapping your gums, talking about you, call, I'm a fierce one. I, 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 sit down. You need to go back and study some more. Somebody did that to me. When I, first, when I first was called to ministry, my pastor, Reverend Dr. Frank Thomas, who is the head of the, he was a pastor for many years. He left, got his PhD as the preaching professor in, at a university in Indiana. He said to me this. I said, I said Reverend Frank, I said, I'm called to preach. I expected Reverend Frank to say, okay, cool, get licensed. Let's go get you your preaching license. Reverend Frank said, pause, your first calling is not to preach, it's to prepare. So he busted me in my face. So I said, what you mean? He said, well, when you graduate from Morehouse, come back and see me. Graduate from Morehouse, came back and see him. He said, okay, this is what we're gonna do. You get your license, that's it. Now where you going to school? I said, what? I just went to Morehouse. He said, what you gonna do? I said, I don't know. He said, then go back to school. Get you some more school. I got some more school, got ordained, right? Because to him, because of who we're ministering to, you can't just put your finger in your ear no more. Ain't he all right? Uh. <laughs> Y'all, <laughs> 
Now, 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 can I be honest with y'all? Help me. I grew up with that. Raise your hand if you. I grew up on that stuff, y'all. My grandfather, my Howard Glenn, that's what they did. You knew how the sermon was going to end. It always said, he died. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> Didn't he die? <laughs> can I get a witness in the building? Are you, do you know that? Keith, come on now. He died. You, every sermon. Every, you preach in Genesis, dog. Why you gonna how you dying in Genesis? So, so <laughs> it's a, look, 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 look. I, I can do it. I can do it. I want to. I do it. Hey. But I tell people. But it was a, for me. I didn't want to be that type of preacher teacher. I wanted to be beyond that. And so for me, studying was important. I said all that to say this. My position is that God can call anybody, regardless of your gender. Any questions? I'm right there. I hate y'all. Work me this hard tonight. Any questions? Go ahead, ask them. Please. <laughs> Please, ask them. I know you think, yes. Yes, sir, make your statement. Yes. Yes, no question. We have HBCU. Yes, sir. They're called HBCU. Yes. And I've had the privilege of sitting in on your class. Yes. Yes. And, and to me, I think that's the only thing we can do on our PWI. Yeah. Is, is to be there to help them understand their own self identity. Yeah. And awareness that they are not who they say they are. Yeah. Now, and at the end of the day, we ought to be encouraging our kids as much as we can to go to HBC. Yes, yes, yes. And let me, let me add to that. So while I'm shaping identity at the university, I'm also deconstructing some of the identity of the black church. Because what I've seen in the black church is a powerful institution be lured to sleep so that it no longer has the strength that it used to. And so now, and so on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm on campus all day building personality. I gotta come here during the week trying to deconstruct personality. Because at the end of the day, we shaped ourselves into this thing that in many cases hurts us. We all become infected. And that's a challenge. As I said on Sunday, there's nothing worse than a slave mentality. And a slave mentality, this is me, you can quote me and tell every pastor I said this, a slave mentality is when you tell women that they are not called and cannot be called to preach. Jarena Lee was one of the greatest abolitionists during slavery. She was a preacher, Jarena, Jarena Lee. So for me, I gotta break some of this because if not, we're not liberating. How are you gonna tell how you gonna tell a female, a young girl, who feels a compulsion from God that God can't use her? How you gonna tell her that? That don't make sense, y'all. Young girl who goes to this church told me, Pastor Coleman, I feel something is in me. I said, what? She said, I feel compelled to ministry. Who, who, what am I gonna say? You crazy. <laughs> what am I gonna tell her, she crazy? No. And she's in college, this is what I don't understand. She in college. You have some dudes who have no school, ain't seen foot in school, don't know how to spell school, and say they call. Somebody say amen. Y'all too quiet for street tonight. Let me get the first one. If you're called, there must be an inner compulsion within the one call to preach or teach the word. He stated there must be a conscientious consciousness within one's own spirit and an awareness of a kind of pressure being brought to bear upon one's spirit. Next, Amanda. 
This is something that happens to you and God acting upon you by a spirit. It is something you become aware of rather than what you do. It becomes an overwhelming obsession that cannot be discarded. It will not go away nor leave a person to themselves. He explained that there becomes no way of escape. Such a strong force lays hold of that person that they are held captive. Somebody say amen. amen. When you're called by God, you can't shake the feeling. It's on you. It's on you, and you can't get rid of it. You can be sitting at an office crunching numbers. It's going to bug you. If it's in you, it's going to hurt. You're going to sit there and go, Lord, what is this in me? Something is strange going on. I can't stop this feeling that I have. Next, go. I'm going to go to a couple right here. Next. That must be an outside influence that will come to the one call. The input and counsel of other believers becomes influential to the one destined for the ministry. It may be the feedback of a pastor, affirmation of an elder. It be the encouragement of another believer. In other words, observant people often recognize the hand of God upon that person before they sense it. Say amen. amen. Do it again. Say amen, y'all. There's some outside influence. Somebody senses something in you. They, they, their, their, their discerning spirit senses that there's a call on your life. Next, go. The one call will experience a loving concern for others. God gives to the one chosen to preach and teach an overwhelming compassion for the people. Everybody shout for the people. As part of this divine choice, the Holy Spirit imparts a consuming desire for the spiritual welfare of others. Stop right there. If God calls you, you love people. Look, look, everybody look up here. I know preachers that can preach but can't stand people. <laughs> I know I know preachers can't stand people like hate them like I don't want to be a rock it's like roaches like get them away from me I know preachers like that if God calls you you have a love for the people your heart and soul belongs to them you want to see them do better you want to see them achieve you want to see them go higher it is a compulsion that you have that you cannot shake you can't call yourself Reverend, apostle, bishop, doctor, whatever, and hate the people. You got a lot of people. Somebody say amen. Right? And you're going to wrestle with that. You're going to wrestle with that. Because here it is. Moses and God had a whole lot of conversation about the people. Moses like, player, what are you doing? You gave me these folk? But then one day God came and said, let me get them. God came, let me get them. God said, let me kill all of them. Moses said, hold on, play. Hold on, hold on. You, you got to have a love for people. If God calls you to it, you got to love the people you serve. The true call always includes a concern about others, and it's just in them a realization of their lost state and condition and desire to do something about them. Next, come on. Whew. There's an overwhelming constraint within one call to do this work, an overwhelming constraint within the one call to do this work. He maintained there will be a sense of constraint meaning they will feel hemmed in to do this work. There is nothing else they can do but pursue this inner drive to preach and teach. Necessity is laid upon them, and they must preach regardless of what others may say. They must minister the word, no matter what obstacles must be overcome. Somebody say amen. That, say amen. Y'all almost done. Say amen. That's how you know you call, because it's an inner constraint. Feel me. Feel me. Y'all got to get this. I'm almost done. Coming out right here. This ain't a popularity contest. Say amen. amen. This ain't, this ain't um, a top model. Say amen. <laughs> this ain't, um, you know, whatever shows on TV where you can show yourself off and, 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 and parade your gifts. This is not a popularity contest. This is not about being popular. This is about being effective. Right. There's this thing on Instagram now where I see preachers and I, it, it amazes me. And I, I, you know, I still struggle with social media. It amazes me that I see preachers and they're like modeling on their Instagram pictures. And I said to myself, I said, I told my boy, I said, Doc, I said, I don't stand that. Like, like, y'all forgive me. This is going to sound funny, but this is, this is the problem Pastor Coleman has. So, so if you're taking a picture of you studying and then you write in the caption, I'm just at the lab studying. To me, you ain't studying. If you have time to take a picture, you ain't doing the work. Yeah, okay, yeah. Y'all feel past the coma. Say amen. 
I, all that taking pictures of yourself reading? Man, bro, just read. <laughs> Why you need a picture of you reading? That made me think you ain't reading. <laughs> do the work. I'm old school. Do the work. If you do the work, the work will speak for you. You ain't got to take no picture and show yourself off. Right? All that? Right? I don't, that's just my, everybody say in my hand. That's just my beef. I got beef with that. So if y'all see me taking pictures of me reading, y'all, <laughs> y'all have permission to slap me in the back of my head. Say amen. I ain't doing that. Say amen. I have books at my house. I read with an S. <laughs> Say amen. If you are called to preach and teach, it is a constraint that you have. It holds you and you cannot let it go. Excuse me. You can't let it go because it won't let you go. If it's in you, if it's in you, if it's in you, you can't shake it. If it's in you, you can't shake it. Whole lot of folk run from ministry because they know the constraint will get on them. If it ever gets you, you, will, you can run as much as you want. It's going to catch you. Somebody say amen. I know some people tonight that have been called to ministry, but they have ran. And I'm telling you, you can run all you want. God will have the final say. He will catch you. And when you least expect it, I tell people, God won't meet you in the church. He'll meet you at the bar at 3 a.m. while you drink in Hennessy. God will sit up right next to you, and he'll tell you, I've been talking to you for 20 years, and I'm finally going to get your attention. That's the God I serve. Maybe you serve that cute little church God. I got a 3 a.m. Hennessy God. Because that's what he calls people. He calls people in unlikely places, doing unlikely things, so that when God calls them and they say they call, folk look and go. God call you? Well, if God can call you, God can call anybody. Somebody say amen. Come on, give God praise tonight, y'all. Come on.